I don't know where they laid him. I don't want to know. If I see the grave and read his name there, then I will have to admit that he is gone. I am not ready to do that. There are still too many things unsaid between us. I'm not finished learning all he had to teach me, and I won't accept his passing. In that first course with him, I judged him deranged. He wandered into the classroom. It wasn't a direction. He was not purposeful in his entry. He just ambled absent-mindedly with his forehead angled slightly toward the ceiling as if he was counting the tiles. He clutched his thick literature textbook firmly in his left hand and held the volume close to his side. When he reached the table at the front of the classroom, he latched his gaze on the portable lectern standing on the table. He kept his eyes on it as he walked around the table. He turned his gaze to us a moment and said, Who left this here? With that, he pushed the wood-looking metal object off the table. It clattered to the floor with a tremendous racket. He laid the textbook on the table, went around to the chalkboard, took up a piece of chalk, turned around, military-like, took three steps, bent at the waist, and looked to be carefully preparing to stand the chalk on the desk. Then, still bent at the waist, he lifted his eyes to me. Of course I was front and center. It took me a long time to get back in school, and I was dead serious about getting my teaching credentials. So I didn't waste time or attention sitting anywhere else but up front and at center. He glared at me with the darkest eyes, nearly black. His brows were very long and bushy, and the lines of his face looked him out to be probably in his late sixties. After a good three seconds, he again turned his attention to the chalk and stood it on its end on the upper right-hand corner of the desk. Then he lifted his eyes to me again. He still bent at the waist. He looked at me as if I was supposed to see some kind of purpose in his actions. Then he just waited, as if this was some kind of inside joke between us. I finally grew so uncomfortable that I looked to the student across the narrow aisle to my right. It was a great relief to see she appeared as bewildered as I was. With the chalk apparently in its assigned place, he stood up, picked up his text, and opened it, practically in the middle, and he began to speak. Literature has two purposes, to entertain and to instruct. A few of us flipped through our text, trying to gauge approximately where in his text he was. After a few seconds, I gave up, opened my notebook, and uncapped my pen. The soliloquy lasted a full 15 minutes. He never looked down at the text. He never turned the page. Before that class was over, he spoke Latin, German, Spanish, Old World English, and he even spoke to an Asian student in his own language. I had no idea what he was talking about, but I was thoroughly entertained. My class participation reflected my confusion. One day he asked me, do you understand what literature is about? I shrugged my shoulders. It's stories, sort of. And then it started, as if delivering a scene from Shakespeare, he said, Stories? His voice was loud and rumbling in indignation. Stories? He said, you have a great deal to learn about literature. His ending smile told me that he was using my situation as a dramatic end. I was still thoroughly entertained by his antics but thoroughly confused. 
Nothing he did or said made any sense to me. I gained solace from other students who echoed my bewilderment at his seemingly undirected teaching. Exam after exam would not meet my expectations. What do you want? I questioned him in his office. He sat with his dark-shoed feet propped up on his desk. Books and papers littered the room. What do you think? He answered. What do I think? I wanted to shout it back at him, but instead I shook my head with yet another cryptic question to my question. What do I think? How am I supposed to know what to think? I'm the student. You're the teacher, so tell me. No. His word was kind, but firm. I will not tell you what to think. And that was the end of the consultation. I threw the heavy masterpieces of English literature textbook down the first flight of stairs from his office. I hate this class. I will never understand what he wants. My angry inward shouting quieted as I looked down the stairs at the limp book. Each step down to it was heavy. I breathed out a defeated sigh as I picked up the book. I sat on the stairs and opened it across my lap. The back of my hand wiped away one stubborn, angry tear. Then in the margin, I had written his words. Literature has two purposes, to entertain and to instruct. I flipped through the introductory material again. I did not remember the entertain and instruct section. It was not there. I went to the library and tried to find it. It was not there either, but something else was, an Oxford Companion to Literature. I opened it and scanned the information on the author and story we were studying. My pen jotted down a few notes. Well, I may not be able to speak to the topic in the margin, but at least now I have something to contribute to the class discussion. I thought about and read over my notes. He set his eyes on me, and he listened to every word I said. Silence hung in my ears as I looked up from my notes. His heavy-lidded eyes closed. He leaned back in his chair. And he said, So? His voice dropped to a dramatic pause. Then he began up the scale with the rest of the question. What do you think? He didn't move or open his eyes, as if something important teetered on that moment. So I thought for a second. Then I said, Well, according to this author, the character is acting out of inward will. But I don't think so. When I finished my statement, he opened his eyes and a smile spread across his face the way smiles did with him. He breathed out a sigh as if something very important just happened. And his eyes were twinkly when he opened them. Good, he said. Then he went on to the next student. What? I wondered. Was I right? What had I done? I didn't know, but whatever it was, I wanted to do it again. Each day as he dismissed class, the distance between the classroom and the library disappeared. I lived in the stacks of books, searching anthology after anthology, cliff notes, literary criticisms, and different modern-day English translations of the old English text we studied. I researched some new idea that had sprung up spontaneously from the literature. I read about the writers, the times in which they lived, the conclusions or inspirations that came from their reading. Each form of literature is somehow connected to the last, weaving a canopy of human literary thought through all history. The day stretched out before me, and soon I was sitting in the sixth class under his tutelage. 
I quickly began an informal essay based on what Dr. Heckmaker called the sudden shift of sensibilities. This shift occurred during the Romantic era, which developed out of the Enlightenment's search for pure reason. I used this idea to support the use of supernatural character in Lord Byron's dramatic poem, Manfred. I took the paper to him, insisting he read it immediately. He feigned fatigue and groaned, Oh, you bother me so. Then he said that with his beautiful grin. Then he quirked up a smile with one side of his mouth and pulled down his glasses to read. He smiled, pretended to frown, and then interjected a few, mm-hmm, there, and a, uh, ah, oh, there. Support this more, clean this up, and resubmit, he said, looking over the tops of his glasses. Is it all right? I asked. I always worried, and he knew it. He smiled. It's good. Very good. As he handed it back to me, I noticed his hands were growing more yellow every day. But I did not say anything about it. Each class period, he moved more slowly to his chair. Would you come to my office after class? He spoke to me in a quiet, fatigued voice. Yes, sir, I answered. Then he opened his text and something moved within him. The power of the literature and his love of it lifted him to his feet. He delivered another magnificent oration. But the energy faded quickly, and he made a languid move to his office chair. He handed me a few dollars. Would you see if you could find some crackers and something mild to drink, he said. I'm feeling quite sick. Never had his hands looked so old. Never had I seen the trembling that his hands were doing at that moment. I'd be glad to, I told him. It was only a short mile to my house from school, so I rushed home, made three pieces of dry toast and a thermos of wheat key. I took sugar, just in case, and two porcelain cups and saucers. After that, many days I took toast, sandwiches, or fresh fruit, and tea to his office, and we sat and talked. They're going to do surgery next week, he said. Well, I'm confident you will come through with flying colors, I said. He shook his head. I don't know this time. I am worried. It was the first time I heard him use those words. He faced heart disease, kidney failure, and cancer bravely, never allowing it to take away his confidence of winning over the diseases that hammered away at his physical body. Besides, I tried to change the mood, you have to teach until I graduate, and you are going to teach my master's classes, remember? He turned up every corner of his face, and in his delicious, warm, low voice, he said, Ah, yes, I do remember. He lay back in his chair and closed his eyes. He sat quietly for a minute or so. I looked around the office. Every wall, every bookshelf was displayed with books and objects his students had given him. You are a fine student, he said. I wondered how many lives he had changed as he had changed mine with those words. Then stillness came over the dark little office as he spoke. I want you to listen to me for a moment, he said. I didn't like the sound of that. I heard very similar words from my grandmother a couple of weeks before she died. Already my voice felt like it might break. Okay, Dr. Hutman, what is it? I said. I want you to continue your education. Can you promise me that? He said. Yes, Dr. Hutmaker, I promise. And I want you to continue developing your gift of writing. Will you promise? He didn't open his eyes as he spoke. Okay, I felt my vocal cords tightening. 
I tried to sound normal, but I could not cover up my sorrow. I will, I said. A tear rolled down my cheek. I brushed it away quickly, hoping he hadn't noticed. I pulled in a determined breath and cleared my throat. Dr. Hutmaker, I started, but suddenly I thought about what I wanted to say, and I knew I had no right to say it. I felt embarrassed and afraid I might embarrass him. I didn't want to sound silly. He opened his eyes and looked at me. I didn't have to say it. I know, he said, and I love you too. I could not let our time together end like that determined to leave him with a positive message. I believed. I said, I have to go to Colorado, but I will come back to see you in the hospital when I get back. Okay, he said. Then he smiled and reached out his arm to me. I walked around his desk and hugged him hard. A tear from his eye touched my hair. I felt it touch my face as I stood and walked to the door. I looked back at him. I'll see you later, Bill, I said as I turned and went out the door. See ya, kid. I could hear him as I continued to walk down the hall. The message light was blinking on the answering machine when I got home. My 15-year-old son had put my mail and messages on the kitchen counter. I was surprised to see how many had piled up in three days. My 18-year-old daughter walked in. She didn't usually come home for lunch. I waved her to come in as I picked up the ringing phone. How long have you been home? It was one of my friends who taught at the university. Her voice was low and serious. I just walked in. Looks like someone's had a busy week. My counter is covered with stuff. You wouldn't believe the wonderful time I had. I started highlighting my trip to her. Honey, she stopped me. Bill died yesterday. It only took a second for the message to clear my reason. Suddenly I began to sob in long gasps. Oh, uh, no, no, God. I sobbed something to my friend and hung up the phone. My daughter put her arms around me. She came home from lunch, hoping to prepare me for the news. We walked to the sofa. I cried and cried. The mournful sound in my voice only made it worse. Why was I crying so hard? He was just my teacher. I was just his student. I felt embarrassed. After the first wash of emotions passed, I moved to the counter and realized that messages were from my friends who knew of my special relationship with Dr. Hutmaker. I can't go to the funeral, I said to my daughter. I felt confused about how hard this was hitting me. No one will understand. I'm just another student. I could not sit there and hold all of this in. I can't go. I didn't go. I didn't want to know where they laid him. It was Dr. Nixon's announcement at the reading of the Baylorian that started the process. Next year's Baylorian will be a memorial to Dr. Hutmaker, she said. I want to write something that will be the most spectacular tribute to him that I can. But I can't. Everything I write has a beginning and a middle, but no ending. I know what I have to do. Do you know where Dr. Hutmaker's grave is? I asked the English department secretary. She wrote out the directions. I can hear the bells of the college calling across the trees from here. Four mockingbirds sing in what sounds like similar songs, but each have started at a different place in the music. They mix their tones with one another. A cicada clatters very slowly somewhere. His noise rises and then falls again in an almost musical way. 
It's over there, in the well-manicured cedar tree. Now another answers it from across the way where the oaks are. Now two more behind me somewhere, dimly answering again. The summer sounds dance across the stone markers like a well-rehearsed ensemble. Someone has planted brilliantly colored moss rose all over the grave. The blooms are so deeply pigmented. Their petals flutter in the southern breeze. There's a swing bench. It's so lovely. Sitting on the glossy, deep green iron slats is nice. Swinging back and forth reminds me of my garden. It's not bad here. It's beautiful. The sun is not too hot. The cool tears feel good with the breeze evaporating them quickly on my face. Thank you, Dr. Hutmaker. You have shown me what literature is. You have entertained and instructed me beyond my greatest expectations. But you must know by now that I won't let you have the last word, for I have realized something else great literature and great literature scholars do. They inspire. You, sir, have inspired me. This is a good place where they laid him. I think he would like it here.